Good day to viewers, the Colonel speaking to you live from the Prime Secretary for British Imperial YouTube Broadcasting. And we're on part nine of The Squire Rambles On. Good afternoon to you, Squire. Good afternoon, Colonel. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, indeed. Welcome to all our viewers. And it's part nine, sort of New Year 2016. Well, I hope everybody had a happy Christmas and uh, I'd like to wish everybody a happy New Year as well. It's just over the New Year now, but... Uh, I hope everybody's remembered to take their Christmas tree down, mm. which uh, the reason I'm mentioning that was one year when we were farming, we were busy, mm. and uh, we put the we put the Christmas tree up on uh, Christmas Eve, and it didn't get taken down till Easter. <laughs> we just didn't have time to do it. We were busy and um, busy outside on the farm, and the Christmas tree, it was the it was a skeleton with all the needles needles on the floor in a circle around the pot. <laughs> dear, oh dear. <laughs> but I suppose, you know, on the farm, work jobs have to be done, and, you know, they take priority. Very much so, yes. and uh, But there again, it never stops. That's the problem. I remember one Christmas Eve, we always had a, as I may have said before, we always had a Christmas party on Christmas Eve. Mm. And, well, in the later years, the friends used to come up to that. And when the last year I was farming, that was the Christmas after my father died, uh, we were going to have a party that was going to be indoors, but unfortunately the cattle thought otherwise. <laughs> and uh, we went to fetch the cows in, and one was in trouble and we had to get the vet. Well, the vet wasn't very happy at being called out. In fact, he was quite miserable. And uh, anyway, he did the job and trundled off. And... Uh, Later on, we had to get him back again because we had another cow in trouble. Oh no! And by which time he'd uh, downed downed a few few uh, few whiskies. A few festive. Uh, <laughs> and we was, yes. was as happy as can be. And, uh, <laughs> a very very different story. <laughs> anyway, we had to, had to but made the milking late, and uh, was a, the Christmas party was held very ad hoc in the cow shed. Oh dear! Oh so dear. I have something to eat and turn a few cows out, and then they do work at it like that. So I think it eventually finished milking at about 10 o'clock, and then everybody went home. <laughs> dear, oh dear, oh dear. But that's the way it has to be on a farm, you well, know. You I live think... there and you work there and the animals take priority. Well, you never know what's going to come up. Mm. But have we got any... are there any questions? I think? Um, I don't... well, Rob was interested in... Um, your experiences of building equipment and that very interesting machine you showed us in a former video, the one you bought off eBay. Oh yes, the um, BRW, that uh, table model. Mm. Yes, I th he asked about, I think he also asked about sound quality. Oh I? yes, yes. When I was actually making, making, mm. yeah, when I was making them. Well it was very dependent on the equipment the monk had lay hands on. Some radios sounded better than others mm. and it was a question of when one set blew up and you couldn't get it fixed, it was a question of mashing in another one. <laughs> yes. Um, and you, then you had to get some, if you were in stereo, you had to get some kind of sound balance. So I had to put a mono record on to start with to try and get a rough, roughly the same level, and then adjust the tone controls, and then put a stereo record on, and you hope to get something nearly right. Well, I think that's what people don't appreciate nowadays, where you just stick a CD in and that's it. Oh, no. Yeah. Now, and if you're using different loudspeakers, you've got to check you got to check their phase properly mm. to get the best quality. But I, th I think the quality I got was reasonable for its time. Um, some things were better than others. Mm. So I might have a radio on one side of the room and a big speaker on the other side of the room. I had to try and get them to sound somewhere near so it gives some kind of a balance. But <laughs> it was all it was all fun and really the best one could do. Well, it's part of the fun and the ingenuity of it all. Sort of going to the local sale and buying a radio or something cheap and hoping to match it up with what you've got. Very much so, indeed. Yes, that's right. Now, eventually I did get a, a proper set and that was, that was, that was quite good then. <laughs> we'll get rid of all the bits and pieces then. Well, yes. What was your first uh, stereo system then? It was a... Uh, had a Goldring Lenko turntable. Leak, a leak amplifier and radio tune and a couple of big Goodman's loudspeakers. Mm. I've still got the Goodman's loudspeakers, but all the rest has gone. I've bought other stuff since. Well, that's it. You know, once you, uh, you know, can afford something, you, you you go for it, don't you? Well, we were lucky in Whit Whitney because there was a a shop called Whitney Audio, 
and they were de hi fi dealers. And one of the things they were always good at, well, they always they were always quite willing to give you a deal. So if you wanted to change your set, they'd buy your stuff, take your stuff in part exchange, mm. and then somebody else had the chance of getting something, getting something else. So well, this is the it. stuff was on the move, really. It was rather quite good. I wonder if such shops still exist that take in stuff second hand. I think people. I think there are. There, are, there. Are, I think there are places, but I. But it was quite a, it was quite a thing in the seven, sixties and seventies, and it certainly made made a difference. Because you, you you get a set of equipment and you want to change, you want to try something else. Well, you've got to dispose of the old, the old. The well, exactly, yes. Stuff. I mean, I knew a chap who changed changed his hi-fi stuff every month. Every month. Oh yeah, too true. Dear, he kept oh, dear. them going for years. And then then I spoke to him the other day and he said, "I oh, you remember those Spendor speakers I bought?" Mm. Yes, I said, "I still got them." I said, "Well, that's that's about thirty five, forty years ago now." Yes, still got them. He said, "Good lord." And he does sort of buying and selling of audio stuff now, so mm. it's amazing, really. Oh no, it was always he had a was keen to describe his latest stuff he bought. Always okay. the ultimate. Well, every, every month the new ultimate. Yes. Well, I suppose it was in those days people were led rather by the opinions in magazines and that. Oh, very much so. Hi-fi mm. news, hi-fi sound, and, and they like were that. rather led by what the manufacturers were. Well, yes, Turning out. it was a lot of, um, it was all advancements then. Well, the thing is, if you bought one thing as the top of the range, sort of one month, you might mm. find by the next month something more interesting had come out. It's like buying these giant televisions nowadays. The problem is you can't keep up with it. No, you can't buy, you buy the latest technology and then by the time you get it home, it's it's yesterday's technology. Well, that's very, very true, yes indeed. You know, there's always something better around the corner. Well, particularly nowadays, you just cannot keep up with it because it's, it's. Um, I mean, with modern technology, with all the new things, I think they go out of go out of date every about every six months, I reckon now. Well, yeah, it's all innovation, and I suppose you had to sort of keep up with the recording quality of LPs in those days. Well, the point is, I people. You see, people can you can buy new LPs today, new vinyl LPs, but the quality of what you buy today would be far better than what you could get years ago, because of course what you were buying in the 60s and 70s was a mass-produced product. Right. Whereas the ones you buy now are sort of really quite quality, quality mm. made. Mm. I mean, they're made on good good quality vinyl and quite thick records too. But in the 70s and uh, 70s and 80s, it could be quite a job to get a good copy, right? Because of um, various problems. I remember I had a record, and I had about had about four copies before I got one that wasn't warped. Dear, oh it dear! Come out warped, and that was a, that was a Deutsche Grammophon LP. It was, and then another set I had. It was a Strauss Operetta on HMV, and the the last side was a Swinger. Oh, it moved across like that, so it wowed all the way through. And I had to get about four copies of that before I got a good one that wasn't a wasn't a swinger. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. So it did happen. It did happen. But I think today, I say the ones, the ones you can buy today seem to be fairly, the ones in the shops fa are fairly modern or c very classic pop records, which is, aren't really the things that interest me. Uh, I think you can still they they do repress they do do repress classical recordings, but um, most of the local stop the shops don't so don't stop those. No, no. But um, I think the thing is though with with anything to do with vinyl, is the the biggest improvement I found was when I chucked the rubber mat away on the turntable and replaced it with an anti-static turntable mat. Right. And that made a difference because the rubber insul the rubber insulated the record and the static charge is built up. Right. Whereas if it's a felt mat, it just, it just it, they don't get so highly charged. <laughs> Very interesting. Oh, yeah. yeah. It does do away with a lot of the crackle. I'm not talking about wear, wear or dust, that's another, but vinyl, uh, vinyl LPs are very, very um, easily charged up with static electricity. How astonishing, I wouldn't have thought of that, but... Uh... And then they really attract the dust. Well, yes. So it's a problem. You see, if somebody had got a, a, something like a Dan set record player, you wouldn't notice the difference. It just wouldn't matter. Mm. But when you've got the something 
that used the high quality stylus and cartridge, well then it would um, you would begin to notice a lot of a lot of crackle. And when if you have the turntables going and and, and and clean them, well that would that would often charge the charge the record up. So yes, it was all all very very good fun. And I suppose people uh, were playing LPs at parties, not only smoking, but also with dust being oh, distributed. Yes. Oh God! So that's yes. why you get LPs that are pretty grim. Well, there's only one answer: if the LP is dirty, it needs washing. Really, mm -hmm. try and keep the keep water off the label. But what I try to do when I've when I've done my washing up in the morning, if the, the water's not too dirty, I usually wash a few records. <laughs> <laughs> with a fairy liquid solution. Mm. What you need is one of those. Uh, do you know those uh, paint pads? Oh yes, yes. For painting, yes. they've got a kind of a, a creamy yellow, mm. quite long mo mo um, he bristle on it, which is very soft. I mm. find those are very good for washing right. records. And then uh, make sure they're dried off properly, and then that'll that'll fetch all the fetch all the dirt off. But do try to keep a, keep it off the label, or it can damage the label. Well, it can, yes. What I really want to do is to get a couple of plates, metal or some kind of rubber line metal plates, to put one each side of the record with a, a little clamp in the middle to stop the label getting wet. Well, yes. I mean, I know people they, they spend thousands, you know, thousands of pounds on these record cleaners. Yes. I saw one the other day in the shop. In the shop, and he said, "Well, it cost me out over a thousand pounds." I thought, "I'll probably do the job." And, and after a while, I mean, my breakfast, <laughs> after doing the breakfast <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> well, I've been doing it for years and haven't had a problem, so... Well, I think a lot of these hi-fi people, uh, with their rare recordings, get very, very technical about it and uh, very um, pedantic, and therefore they, you know, it's part of the kudos to actually buy one of these record cleaning machines and then fiddle about with it cleaning records that probably don't need that much of a clean. Well, they they talk about deep well, deep cleaning them. Well, of course, the, the the dirt can get if it's if a record is played dirty. Well, then the the stylus will push the um, the dirt into the right into the bottom of the groove. But mm. I found it's worked very well. I've transformed records by doing that. Seventy eights as well, just the same. Well, yes, was. yeah, just yeah. Much, they're dirty. Get the dirt off, then they'll play properly. Some of them are horrific. Oh well, yes. With grit and all sorts of things, where nothing's going to sound well. Like cold that. dust and yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. Rat droppings and goodness oh, knows Lord, what yeah. else. Just get rid, just wash it off. And it always made me smile in a way when it when it became to the choice people's choice of equipment. Mm. You often found that musicians quite often had the worst the worst equipment you can imagine. <laughs> You'd think they'd have the best, and they'll find somewhere with an incredible, incredibly awful, awful stuff. Well, I suppose and yet it's people who didn't, who who didn't play, who perhaps didn't have. You know, you had a musician with a good ear, mm. and they, you know, just real junk. Some of the stuff they had, you would, you would. You would I suppose even, they're too busy actually playing music to worry you, about playing other people playing not just, music. Not to that extent, but even mm. you know even even amateur people. Uh, People who play the instruments quite often had hopeless equipment. <laughs> it made me smile. Oh dear, oh dear. Not very odd. And then people that tone, which were actually tone deaf, had the most incredible stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's all very odd. But the thing is, I think the thing is, is, is all if one's going to do something like that, is to get to get the best you can afford, really. Well, I think that's the best advice, isn't it? And plan it, and plan it so that you spend about an equal amount. They always used to say, get a budget and then spend about an equal amount on the, on the speakers, and the amplifier, on the turntable as a rule of thumb, mm. because it's no good having a, a, a four or five hundred pound turntable linked to a. A rubbish, a rubbish cheap amplifier. <laughs> you won't, you won't, it won't tell the difference. Well, it won't matter, will it? <laughs> yes. But where vintage equipment is concerned, I still think the Goldring Lenko turntables take a hell of a lot of beating mm. today. The sort of GL75. Yes, there's not a lot wrong with those. Gowards Goward and the Goward ones. Most of them thought the, Gow the Gold Rings were better because they were um, variable speed. That is a huge advantage, I must admit. Well, it is for, the, for well, those of us with old records. Mm. It doesn't matter so much for with L, you know, if, if somebody's got a 19. 
40s, 50s collection, it doesn't really matter because um, there's not a lot you can do with those, but mm. with the early records, yes, certainly. Yes. And then, uh, then of course, I suppose, of course, the, the, the 70s started the big revival in, well, locally, the big revival in collecting 78s and wind up gramophones again. Yes, I suppose it's part of the nostalgia boom of that time. You had films like The Railway Children, well, that's late 60s, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, and, that's right. Um, yeah. All sorts of other things, can't remember them now. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang was another. Well, that's right, yes, um, yes. And uh, the Foresight Saga on the telly. Oh, golly, yes. And right. people starting look started looking back, rather. Yes, that's true. Very, very and true. And then in the 80s you had, or early 80s, Brighthead Revisited. Oh, yes, that's right. And absolutely. everyone wanted to be sort of wearing Oxford bags and uh, floppy hair and punting around <laughs> oh, yes, one right. way or another. Yes, that was that. And was having true. a portable gramophone. You know, when you were in the jam factory, I imagine you sold quite a few machines to it undergrads. Was, well, the thing was, when in those days the students were on grants. Yes. And that made a difference. Yeah, absolutely. As soon as, the, as soon as they did away with the grants and went on to this other system, that all finished. It finished more or less overnight. Well, yes, it, it did. You and know. otherwise people would come in, the girls would come in and choose a dress and their boyfriends would come and buy a gramophone or something like that. Mm. I did really well for several years there. <coughs> mm. But it was, such a, it was such an interesting place to be, though, full of characters. Every single one was a character in that place. Yes, I remember it well. <laughs> Yes, I think it must be nearly 20 years that's been closed now. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. It's unbelievable, really. Well, it is. Yeah. I remember coming in there the day you'd sold out, more or less. No, oh, that's right, yes. I think I had an Italian dealer come in and buy the whole lot. <laughs> he cleared the unit. I think yeah. I only got a few records and a, and a few needle tins, and that was about it. I think, I think that was about it. You had your display case with a few needle tins in. A rather rather slim box of records, and the rest of the unit was empty. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think you had that red ninety nine on the. Oh really? Ah, on yes. the uh, H and B ninety nine on the stand. Ah yes. That yes, you'd recovered, yes. but yes. apart from that, yeah, but yeah. of course people forget it wasn't that easy to get hold of stock. It was quite relatively easy to sell it. Oh, that was the, that was that really was the problem. Oh golly, yes. Well, they used to have to advertise at one stage. I but don't mean interesting stuff either, just oh, no. for ordinary oh, things. No, 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 no. Oh, it just gets to get hold of basic stuff to do up and resell, really. Mm. Anything interesting was a was just a it was a very difficult to find and would have been too expensive. Well, yes. Yes, I didn't find very many really interesting machines for a, until fairly recently. No, the last 20 years has been very, very different. I think with eBay, it's brought a lot of... It brought a lot of stuff out, certainly. Certainly, and the, I mean, the older collectors, a lot of the older collectors have passed, sadly passed away now, mm. and their collections have come on the market. And there are few, very few new collectors coming into it. And that's, just, that's the trouble, generally. That is, mm. it's a, with all fields yes. of collecting, yes. it's the fact that a lot of people aren't interested, which is a pity. Mm. Because if you've got if you've got a collection of something, at least it gives you a hobby and it gives you an interest. That's it. I've never been I've never lacked for anything to do. I've always had something to do, either something to repair or restore or records to sort out or, or something like that. It's always been something to carry on with. Boredom was a thing I only for any experienced at work. <laughs> <laughs> well, for some people their work is their life. Oh, well, yes, that's never been my philosophy. I think it's work to live, that's me. Well, this is it, you know. Ne never live never live to work. That's a, that's going down a difficult one-way street. Well, you hear of people who retire at 65 and two weeks later they're dead. Or, you know, a fairly short time after. I've known P.S. I've known several people like that too. Yeah, I have, Absolutely. you know. I remember one chap, he said, oh, I shall enjoy, I shall play golf every day. Well, after about two weeks he played golf, he'd had quite enough of that. Yes. He saw the same old faces at the bar and the mm, same mm, old faces mm, in the mm, club, mm, heard the same old jokes and got fed up with it. Absolutely. And I said, you ought to get yourself something to do. Next time I heard of him, he'd, he'd had a heart attack. Good Lord. Goodness gracious. Me. Absolutely extraordinary. He said, oh, oh, you know, it's a change in pace of life. I said, we want to have, have some interests in life. But he hadn't. His interest was his work. Yes, it's very sad when it's like that because it's a pity because there was a lot out there to, mm. to get involved in. 
Well, I knew another couple who were very, very wealthy people, owned a very large house, he'd sold his business for good money, and he and his wife didn't know what to do with themselves, so they sat there drinking gin or... or no, it was... I, no, it was gin. They <laughs> drank gin or... A friend of mine was employed as their gardener, mm. and he was given a brand new sort of mini digger, and he said, what do I do with that? And the, the chap said, well, you dig holes in the garden, put all the gin bottles in and cover them back up again. <laughs> And, you know, they, they went through, they, they started about half past eight in the morning. Mm. And they had mountains of bottles outside the house. And I thought, with all their money, they could have done anything in life. It's so sad. I could have sold them all sorts of stuff. <laughs> Ditto, likewise, yeah. But the course. trouble is, you know, they had no interests. No, no, no. Didn't right. want to walk, didn't want to go out, didn't really like going shopping apart from gin. <laughs> You know, the local Victoria wine did very well out of them. Well, I don't I, mean, I know. I, I live on my own at, uh, in the rectory, and I, I yes. get on all right. I, no problems at all. No. I moved there about two years ago, and it's been really, really good. It was a nice, good move, actually, nice, wasn't nice it? Nice little town. Yes, it was a good move, because you've got everything in one place. You don't need to go any... Not like me having to go into Oxford for the shopping and that. No, That's exactly. An absolute right. pain. Oh, well, I mean, Oxford's a... I only ever go into Oxford on the bus anyway. I haven't taken the car into Oxford for 20 years. Well... I, I wouldn't do it now. <laughs> no, I must admit, I've got as far as the uh, as North Oxford and the and the park and rides, and that's about it. Anything other than that, I, th I think I'd have to say no. <laughs> you know, well, or I'd cycle in. Well, I think a lot of people, I mean, you're where you live here, that they don't go into Oxford at all. They get in their cars and go out to other places. I, I don't think they? they probably do, actually. Yes, I remember I hearing that years ago. That that um, in Oxford it's like two different worlds. You, you mm. never get a person from North Oxford going to East Oxford or something like well, that. Well, no, they wouldn't know where it was. I don't think. Yeah, <laughs> I always used to be told that. Yeah. Of course, the university. Well, that's a that's another question on its own, isn't well, it? Well, it used to be town and gown, simple as that. Never the twain would meet, apart from sort of major fights and riots. Well, St. Scholastica's Day riot, well, Saint Scal Saint Day right, wasn't it? Oh, yes. Golly, yes. Yes, and then you used to have the um, the balls, and then there used to be, always used to be a riot after one of them. Um, uh, it used to make me laugh when I used to work in Oxford. I used to come be going in in the morning, had to get there for about half past seven, and see them all staggering about up to the commemorate. <laughs> In a right pickle, all that by yes, Walton I, Street, all up there. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about there, Squire. <laughs> <laughs> to see all that. Yeah. Oh, I was wearing my white tie over Christmas. <laughs> I was wearing other things as well, obviously, but uh, oh, no, we keep up some thing. standards at the private <laughs> sector, you know. Yeah. One thing that always brings Oxford mm. to life, though, is St Charles Fair. Oh, yes. I mean, I know a lot of people grumble about it, but it's, it is rather good as it's still being still being held there. I know it mm. causes traffic chaos. Well, it's always traffic chaos in Oxford it happens all the rest of the year as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> still, I mean, where I am at Market Snodgebury, we have a decent fare there. You do. And in fact, I was busy on Boxing Day picking up the uh, three muses we can see there. Yeah. And um, otherwise I would have come round to have a look at the meat that you ha they have there. Yes, that's right. That's yes. very nice. Yeah, well, that's always Boxing Day. Yeah. I didn't get down there this time because I was going to get, had to go out and so I didn't have time. But it's, so I went the first first year I moved then, yes. It indeed. was packed. It, yes, there were. There were thousands of people. Yeah. I don't really agree with hunting. No, no nor but me, but um, it's, it's just something to go and, <laughs> go and see on Boxing Day, really. My father used to hunt. He used to be a keen huntsman. He used to right. back in the reef. But not when my, and I knew him. We used to go following the hounds in the Land Rover mm. but when we were on the farm. But well, that sounds to, like a very sensible thing used to, to do. Used to ride, used to ride the hounds when he was young. Mm. Well, in those days, there was no, there was a completely that's what different, people did. That's a different world in those days. It was a country world. Yeah, and that's very much so. Yeah, foxes are, are were and are vermin. And well, the trouble is, the trouble is, I think the problem is today. You can, the thing is now that you don't have to have live birds. You don't have live no. chickens. Uh, like they used to in those days. And, and ordinary people, ordinary cottagers would have two or three chickens mm. for the eggs and maybe the occasional bird. But, you know, it was a it was a touch-and-go thing. It was about survival. So if a fox got their chickens, you know, they were they were really um, snookered. Absolutely, yeah. I remember, I remember people a bit like that years in mm. the earlier days. Well, people were scr literally scratching a living. 
Well, it was, I mean, the chickens in the garden were an essential, absolutely essential. Yeah, and, and you know, a little bit of an allotment, and that kept the family oh, going. Oh, true, it did. Well, most, a lot of the cottages and houses had big gardens. We look at some of the, the big gardens some of the council houses had. They were enormous. Absolutely, yes, you're quite right. Yes. And didn't your father have a saying relating to the hunting field? Yes, you always, you always reckon that you either got people in with the hunting field, you either got the best manners or the worst. <laughs> That's what he said. You either get yeah. the best or the worst. You very well rarely get in between. Well, there used to be a class of people which I don't think listeners or viewers would believe existed, but they did exist, and I remember them when I was a child, called County. Oh, best. Yes, indeed. And they yeah. were obnoxious um, individuals. They'd have... Um, Usually it would own, be landowners, but not huge amounts of land. No. But they had huge amounts of ego and rudeness. I think the problem. I think the problem always was, if you were somebody who was, who was a real nobility, mm. they were fine. It yes, was the, I am. It was the jumped up ones who came, who made their money in the city. Or something like that, and then came out and bought land in the country. Well, there are two or three generations from that. They were self-made people, yeah. and they were usually the the children or grandchildren of self-made people. They'd gone to a public school, not had a very good time because they were in trade, and then they'd come back and lord it over everybody else oh. because they had a few bob. Oh. But by the time I knew them, they didn't have very much money, and usually okay. living in a run-down house, <laughs> not unlike this one. <laughs> Although this isn't run-down now that we've done it up, and it looks like the Crossroads Motel tell but um yes it, they, they were a class of people that i don't think exist anymore john betjamin uh, wrote a poem um about them and um mm, he talks mm, about um, um the help travels third whilst they travel first and uh, mm. county is what they are you know it's it's pretty they're pretty unpleasant people well i mean i remember my my, my, my father and mother saying Oh, she to he or she or she's just or oh, just trying to be county. <laughs> we used to say that all the time. Yes, it, it's a thick phrase you tend to forget. They were. They tend- weren't nobility. They weren't gentry. No, no, that's right. They were something in between. Yes, that's right. That's and uh, the, yeah. I don't think they exist anymore, really. Well, no. They're no. the sort of characters you often see in Agatha Christie. Yes. Yeah. Programs yeah. certainly in the books. Well, the the thing was, I mean, the the village, the manor was all was always almost obligatory to be some ex Indi- old Indian Army colonel or something like that. They were always colonels or brigadiers at the moment. <laughs> well, yeah, in fact, I think you've mentioned it. They used to have Jim Carners and Point to Points, and you used to say they'd always be run by a brigadier or, or some, oh, some yes. ex Indian Army character. Well, I used to, get, I used to, I used to um, back in the 50s, 50s, 80s, in the 50s, I was certainly t- used to go to Jim Carners. Yeah. It's a thing you don't see about these days. And I haven't seen one for so years. Popular. Every, almost every village had one. The best way to see that is to see that episode in Darling Buds of May. Absolutely. That. And that is wonderful. That's not fiction. That's a, uh, that's a, that could almost be a documentary. It is a documentary. I remember it just like that. <laughs> Oh. It's not. It's not some sort of um, sort of rosy, rose-tinted spectacles yeah. view of the way the world was. That's how it was. Yes, I remember. There was. I remember talking about that. The there used to be the Whitney Horse Show. Mm. My father was a keen horse. He used to be the chairman of the horse association in those days, and uh, they used to have a horse show once a year in Whitney. Um, it's all built on that land now, but it, I remember it. Really? Yeah, oh, and it was. Uh, yes, I remember they. I remember the woman who was the secretary used to used to do the when they used to do the entry forms. There was a really amusement one day, and there was um. Uh, this this person came in and said, um, and she wanted to enter her son for this this class, and this lady said, "Well, what's his name?" Said, I Jones. Hmm. Oh, right, okay. No, 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 she said, I, Jones. Yeah, right, okay. I for Alan. <laughs> I forgot, I for Alan. And then um, they used to have the, because um, they used to have to set the field out and put the jumps up, and um, I remember there was this, this conversation between these two men, and um, and one said to the other, my horse won't jump that. He said, what do you mean, won't jump it? He said, I can jump it myself. And he did. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I'll never forget that. <laughs> He's leapt over his fence. <laughs> God. That's just the sort of thing you would have heard in exactly. those days. Yes, that's right. Absolutely. It's a different world, slower, less fast-paced yeah. and uh, unpleasant. That, that's really good. Well, well, we used to go to the county show, and there was no commercialism in those days. All you'd see is some corn dollies and mm -hmm. other such rubbish, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, we didn't enjoy it at all. But occasionally we went to horse shows, and that was my grandparents very keen on horses. Mm -hmm. My father was a very good rider as well, which surprises a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it should surprise them. It certainly surprised me, though, but uh, I never saw him on horseback, but uh, he was a... Yeah. He was well known uh, locally for that. Anyway, we go to these horse shows, and there'd always be these. Uh, how can I describe them? They would be ex Indian Army, I would think, brigadiers and people like that. They usually had white moustaches, and oh yes, they'd be yeah. very well turned out with That's sort of white yachting trousers. That's right, yeah. Very inappropriate, and sort of um, they'd either have stripy, stripy blazers and uh, maybe a straw hat. Uh, or they'd have a sort of straw Panama and a blue blazer and a sort of regimental tie. That's right, yes. And they used to be guzzling um, gin, again. Um, you know, by the bucket load, these blighters could knock back gin, gin and tonic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they'd always be looking at these... It's, it's vaguely sinister looking back. And all these teenage girls, and you think of Thelwell cartoons... Mm. Of these big fat ponies with these <laughs> the big fat girls on but with freckly faces. True though. And the thing is, the, the and some of them were slightly older than girls, and these old brigadiers would be looking at these girls, saying, "Oh, look at that lovely withers," and they weren't looking at the horses. No. Yeah, no. They were looking at the <laughs> back end of the girls, I think. I'm not quite sure what they were talking about, but they seem to know. They were sort of hot. It's, it's sinister looking back, but yeah. I don't think anything odd happened, but you never no, know. I but then in the same, at the same time, you had these working men's clubs yeah. where they had all these children performing on stage yeah. and that, and it, it yeah. seems odd now. It's, yeah. I don't know whether we've changed or we yeah. view the past yeah. in a different yeah. way, but it seems odd. Those Thelwell cartoons are brilliant. Oh, they're, they're, there's a wonderful Betjamin again poem about um, um, Jim Carners and things. Oh, you yeah, know. yeah, yeah. I, f I wish I had to hand my book of Betjamin because I would read it to you, viewers. Yeah. It's something about uh, Diana's uh, horse has swallowed its bits or something. You had to fish down its throat with a spanner. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and God. that sums it up. You know, oh. all these really quite unpleasant girls but the, the the only creature on earth that can manage a horse a big horse is a teenage girl it's funny isn't it mm. and Thelwell got yeah. it just right oh golly yes they lead to those 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 um penelope wasn't it yes penelope was the one he used to uh, his and wife then was, was, was then that was that marvelous um and then there was that marvellous one. They did the they did the two shooting passes. Have you seen that cartoon? No, I don't. It's one the rough shoot and the smooth shoot. <laughs> you, you've got you've got the you've got the, the the smooth shoot with everybody with long faces and and then the uh, the rough shoot with big grins and big yeah. cheesy grins and the dogs are just the same. It's really funny. It's a wonderful piece of work. Keen yeah. observation. Well, it is, and it's it's strange how people in those days, the horsey women look like their horses. Or, and the men often look like the dogs. That's the funny thing. Oh, yes, that's right. I remember thinking that at the time. You know, this was in the early 70s when this sort of life was sort of petering out, really. Yes, indeed. And I can't say I've seen a point-to-point a, a -point or a Jim Hakana in, in maybe 20 years or more. Yeah. No, no, I don't know what they do about... I don't know what they do about racing now because at one time, of course, it was all National Hunt. Well, half of it was National Hunt. Yes, it was, it? yes. And... Um, point to point so with, I don't know what they do now they don't do hunting no. I'm not quite sure I'm well out of I'm well I'm well away from it well you just uh, even driving through the countryside you'd see signs wouldn't you point oh, to point point today point, and this yeah. sort of thing well there was always one one Easter Monday I think it was mm. at way over on Berkshire Downs I think that was the the one they used to have we used to go to mm. Heathrow weren't it so, yes Heathrow used to go to Heathrow point to point mm. it used to be fun going point to points it was a a very sort of um I don't know, gentle race course, race meeting, yes. really. Yes, yes, I suppose it would be. Yeah. Things were gentler in a lot of ways then. You know, we used to go to the county show at uh, Hartwell House in those days, yeah. in the 70s, and yeah. it was very peculiar, the, the, <laughs> the class system in operation. You had the landowners in their sort of very gracious but old Rolls Royces and that, 
and very old tweeds looking really scruffy. They'd pour out of these great big cars. You know, scruffy, the chauffeur would be well driven, but the car would be slightly down at heel. Oh. And so would they. And then you had the tenants who'd arrive sort of on the back of a, a farm, what, three wheel farm wagon with a sort of tractor held together with baler twine. Mm. And then you'd have the the new map, the new men, the the city money who'd turn up and they'd often drive Jaguars and they'd be really well dressed with brand new tweeds. Oh yes, right. And they never fitted in and were not I don't know whether they were directly barred from the sort of landowner's beer tent, but they they didn't seem to get in. Oh no, no, no. You don't um, Oh yeah, there was definitely a, definitely a, um, uh, oh, what's the word? There was definitely a division, a very a stiff division of that, wasn't there? Well, you had in the in the uh, landowner's tent a sort of uh, proper bar set up mm. and uh, bentwood chairs and a few sort of those what they used to call cricket tables yeah. with three legs. Yeah. Uh, they'd be set up in there. And then you had the tenants where they'd have some rough old planks on on some uh, on some cra apple crates with sort of uh, cider coming straight out the barrel. <laughs> and then you had well, I don't know. I didn't go into the sort of uh, the new men's tent. It was probably far too swish. But there was no sponsorship or advertising. It was just country people That's doing right. country things. Well, we used to go into. We used to. Well, we used to, the, the local fair was the Oxfordshire County Show. That mm. was at Kidlington, at the Oxford Airport. Oh, right. That was the, our local one. Mm. And every four years, the Royal Show used to come there. Oh, yes. That used to be the big one. But That's stopped now, hasn't it? I believe it has, but I yeah. think every four, at one time, every four years, the, the, Ox, the, the Royal used to come. And then they bought a permanent... Uh, site at Stoneley in Warwickshire. They did indeed. And I believe that's all now gone. I haven't yeah. heard anything about that. I can't remember what happened, but I think they had several years of really bad weather. Uh, yes, that's and right. The insurance just uh, was yeah. astronomical, so they said we yeah. can't do it anymore. I used to enjoy. Oh, and foot and mouth, of course. Oh, of course that, yes. that that really yeah. knocked yeah. it for six. I used to enjoy the county show there. That mm. used to be a good day out there. Well, from father and wanted to go and look at the animals. I wanted to go and have a look yeah. at the tractors and things. Like yeah, wasn't the least bit interested in animals. I thought well, for those wretched things. You see one cow, you see them all as far as I was concerned, but you'd yeah. you'd see all these old farmers and landowners round the edge of the ring and taking a huge the ones who weren't looking at the lovely withers, yeah. um were were looking at literally the lovely withers, you know, they're parading oh, these God, horses yeah, round and, right, yeah. and the horses were very elegant. No, you're well well you've seen one cow giant fat cow, you've seen them all as far as I could see. <laughs> oh golly, yes. Yes. Yeah, and then you have the flower arranging tent with the fat farmer's wives. And it was Women's Institute. That was <laughs> Women's Institute. Oh, I'll tell you what, we went to one, the went Oxfordshire show, and Father was a member of the National Farmers Union, mm. <coughs> and that was, uh, that was they, they had a, 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 a tent there where we could get lunch. And mo Mother, went, we all went in there once, and Mother said, we'll never go in there again. Oh. It, was, it was like a World War One field kitchen. Oh dear, oh dear. Oh dear. So we, we always went into the... Um, Women's Institute after that, that was always very nice. Right. But then as you went round, the, a lot of the um, local agricultural firms and businesses had stands there and they Ooh, used, yes. to, um, used to get bits to eat and cups of tea and coffee and things like that. I think the phrase lavish hospitality well, comes Well, there was a bit of hospitality, but then as yeah. they said, what, when we, what they found was the farmers would put an order in in front of all their mates just to be big and then of course the next day they telephone and cancel it. <laughs> Why does that sound familiar? You know? <laughs> dear oh dear. Yes indeed my word. <laughs> Seems like a long time ago now. Well it is a bit of a different world. I, uh, yeah. I, it's yes. strange really isn't it? Uh, yeah. Well I hope you've enjoyed us uh, rambling away there viewers. Well it may have got a few more a bit more to come yet so <laughs> i hope everybody's enjoyed it and um look forward to uh being with you again soon yes wonderful thank you for tuning in viewers and uh, we'll be with you again in the near future thank you and goodbye <laughs>